Respected brothers and elders and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Based on the teaching of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man lam yashkur in nas, lam yashkur in lah. He said that the one who doesn't thank the people, he doesn't thank Allah. Allow me to thank every one of you for being here, or for having me here as well. And I would like to thank the brothers who have organized this beautiful event. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I've been asked to talk about the da'wah and the worry and concern of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for this ummah. We know that before the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what was the condition of the Arabs? The Qur'an, the verses that I've recited, the Qur'an in its comprehensive nature explained to us that the people were lafi dalalim mubin in open era. Before the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they were misguided. They were away from the true guidance. They were away from the nubuwa, the light of prophethood. In another verse, Allah says, وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ شَفَىٰ حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ That you were about to fall into a pit of hell. This is, this is what Allah is telling us, that they were about to fall into a pit of hell. In another verse, Allah says, ظُلُمَاتٌ بَعْضُهَا فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ that they were in darkness, that darkness upon darkness. That if a man were to take his own hand out, he could not even see it. This was the moment, respected brothers, that Allah Azza wa decided to send Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the people were having crisis, there were problems, there were domestic problems, economical problems, political problems, social problems. They were going through all sorts of problems. They could not find answers. Answer was in the light of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People, they didn't even know how to have a transaction. They didn't know how to even marry. And you could understand this when Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he went to Abyssinia, when he went to Ethiopia, and, and Negus asked the question that, why did you all turn away from the teaching of your people? And you could feel the pain, not only the statement, you could feel the pain of Ja'far when he narrated this. He said, Ayyuhal Malik, inna kunna qawman ahla jahiliyya, na'budu al-ahjar, wa na'kulu al-mayta, wa na'idu al-banat, wa kana al-qawiyu minna ya'kulu al-da'if. He said, O oh, king, we were, we were people of ignorance. We used to eat dead. Our own intellect failed to give us the understanding that we shouldn't be eating dead animals. I mean, we should find animal that is dead. It's been died because of some disease. But because we had no guidance, we had no sharia, we used our own intellect, we should take it and we should eat it, which was dangerous for our health. We didn't, we didn't even know that much. And na'budul ahjar, we should worship stones. 
The idols that we used to worship is from stones, and we know that. But we couldn't comprehend. Because we never had Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, once the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he led his salah in the masjid. After he led the salah, he was going out. As he was going out, he saw some companions sitting in the gathering. Some of them were talking, and some of them were, were crying, some were laughing. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went towards them. He said, what makes you cry? And why is it that some of you are smiling? He said, oh Prophet of Allah, we're just thinking that if you didn't come to us, and if you didn't come and give us guidance, then what would have happened to us? He said, and why are you smiling? He said, oh Prophet of Allah, I'm smiling because I'm from a tribe called Banu Hanifiyya. My tribe, they made a god out of dates. And it was a huge, big statue. But what happened? We worshipped this statue for two and a half years. And then there was a drought, and there was no food to eat. So we all got together and we collectively ate the god that we made. And I'm laughing as well that we've done all this. We know this was wrong and it wasn't correct to do any of that. But despite the fact my tribe continued with idol worship. Oh Prophet of Allah, I'm laughing, I'm smiling, but I'm crying at the same time that if you didn't come and invite me, what would have happened to us? <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he blessed him and then the Prophet of Allah went away. The Ja'far is relating this to niggas. Ashamai was his name. That old king wished to worship idols, stone, wished to, wash, uh, wished to eat dead. And the economical crisis, he in one word, he very comprehensively he said. After all, he was a Qurayshi as well. And he was the most eloquent of them all. He said, al minna yakul al-da'if. The idea was, the ideology of the rich was that the rich will remain rich and the poor will remain poor. Maybe you will say this was happening even in our situation as well. But that's what happened b back then. That the rich will stay rich and the poor will stay poor. And the literal translation, what he said is more powerful. He said, the strong amongst us is to eat the weak ones. And he said, Allah Azza wa Jal, then he sent Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the condition of the Arabs before the arrival of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The social crisis, subhanAllah, they didn't know even how to have a transaction. In a little transaction, business transaction they're having, a fight will break out and that will continue for 40 years. Okay? This, this was the situation of them. And in marriage, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, she said that during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa before arrival of Islam, there was five types of marriage. And I don't have the time to go into details. I only mention two. One is the one that, alhamdulillah, Islam has continued, where there will be a proposal, the parents will get involved, and there will be either you accept it or reject it, and there will be dowry, and the respect will remain from both sides. Okay? The other two is that a woman, this is legitimate marriage, by the way, this is very important for us to understand. The moment you turn away from Sharia, when you violate or when you turn away from the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you think that I'm going to come with better ideas because I'm a very knowledgeable person, then that will misguide you. So the, the legitimate marriage at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, before Islam was that a man, that a woman would put a flag outside, and she will say that I'm ready for conceiving. Any man is allowed to come and pass the night with me. And this was okay. Many, many leaders would go and they would do this as well. You know, and it wasn't a problem because society, they said this is fine. So when you blind follow society and you turn away from the teaching of Quran and Sunnah, this was going to happen. You will be doing things that will, people will laugh later on. Another marriage, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says, is that a woman, she will sleep with many men. And, and forgive me for being very frank because it's in the hadith. And then this woman would become pregnant. When she will become pregnant, then she will later will deliver the child. When she will deliver the child, she will look at the appearance of the child, and she will call all the men who, who slept with her, at 10 or 11, whoever they, whatever number. She will then examine the child's appearance, and then she will then say that I think that this child matches so and so, so you step forward and you will become the father of the child. This was all legitimate marriage. Obviously, Islam came and abolished all that. <laughs> and domestic problems as well. Husband and wife fighting for pity, pity reason. Rasulullah Sallallahu came with such guidance that even that will come to an end as well. And also, another problem they had that Ja'far reported, Radiallahu Anhu, 
كنا نائد البنات we used to uh, bury our daughters alive the people of Quraysh Banu Tamim Banu Tha'laba Banu Hanifiyah these are really big tribes but in their tribe something was dominant that if there's a girl in the community if a man is about to have a child if he's a female if he's a girl then they have to bury her alive because it's going to be difficult you're probably thinking that this is really happened the Quran tells us this وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى وَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدَّ When any one of them were, were to give in the good news or a glad tidings or a news that you have a baby girl. وَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدَّ He wasn't happy. His face is to be dark. وَهُوَ كَظِيمُ And he's to be angry with inner grief. <coughs> and then Allah Azza wa Jalla says يَتَوَارَ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوِي مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ This man is to go hide from his people. What my friends will say, oh, you got a baby girl. I heard your wife was pregnant, so what is it, a boy or a girl? So because the girl is to go hide for many days. Thinking, ruminating. Would he keep this child alive despite the fact he will be dishonored in the community? Or would he cast her into the darkness of the grave? This was the situation before the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Having said all the bad qualities, they did have some good qualities, the Arabs. One of the things that they were Bedouins, they were very honest people. Uh, if they recognize something to be truth, they will fight tooth and nail for it. And you know that that benefited the Prophet wasallam. They were people of honest people. They would not lie. They would not exaggerate as well. This is a very good quality because if you look at the East and West at the time of Rasulullah wasallam, you had the, in the East, you had the Byzantine, the, uh, the, the Persian, the Sassanid empires. In the West, they had, you had the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. Yes? Now, you have the Sassanid, the Persian, you have the Roman their way of treating was different. They were like robots. Their respect for the king was like robotic. For example, a man, a Sassanid Empire once, he gave a sermon. Everyone has to look down. No one could have eye to eye con contact with him. And then one person, he said, he's got a question. He raised his hand. In the gathering, they came and they chopped his hand off. He said, how dare you talk to the king? You know, they had this kind of behavior as well. How dare you talk to the king like that? How dare you even raise your hand? This is how they behave, the Sassanid, and also the Romans, they were not far away from it as well. The Romans, for example, if the Roman Empire, he makes a decision, it will go against the Bible, doesn't matter. Let it be written, let it be done. You know, that's how they were. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was sent to the people that they were not like that. They would speak to the leader, they would speak to the king. You know, they will see the, uh, the leader walking around, they will say to him, Imu Sabahan, good morning king, how are you? They would have a conversation like that, not a problem. Uh, you know, may you be free from the curses of the people they would have this kind of communication so what does it mean? it means if they do accept Islam they will be very open they will criticize they will ask questions <coughs> and they will be sincere they won't be you know, hypocrit hypocritical approach would be there they won't be hypocrites so Rasulullah was sent to the people so they also had these few good qualities which is important to mention because you probably were asked this question how come the Prophet of Allah came to the Arabs not to the Persian and not to the Roman it's because of this reason and many other reasons anyway. So, uh, allow me to tell you a, 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 a transaction was about to happen between a Bedouin and a king in the Arabian Peninsula. The king came and he said that, oh, this is your horse? He said, yes. He said, it's a beautiful horse. It's so, you know, I don't know if you've seen the Arabian horses. They're huge and beautiful. He said, I would like to have this. And the king said, you have to give it to him. But the Bedouin stepped forward. He said, Abayt al -lana. He said, may you be free from all the curses of royal, king, uh, royal highness. But this sikab, this horse, it belongs to me. It's such a horse that it cannot be borrowed, it cannot be used, it cannot be sold. I will sacrifice my life for this horse. Sometimes my family are kept hungry, but not the horse itself. So how could I give it to you? So, obviously, uh, the king, he walked away. Not a problem. As for uh, the Persian, for example, uh, one of the Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the Muslim convoy, uh, Al-Mughira bin Shu'bah, Rustum asked him, that, come and speak to me. He went to see him. He, when he went to see him, he saw him sitting in a throne, and it's so huge, you know, there's so much space there. So he went straight to him, sat next to him. That's what the Arab would do, isn't it? They grabbed him, they pulled him out, and they put him on the floor, and they were about to hit him. So he turned around, he said, leave me alone. Kunna kana anukum al -ahlam. We used to think that you people are really smart people. Ma minkum. I have not seen any stupid, foolish people like you. 
We speak to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam directly. He's our leader. Here, look at you people standing here, looking down. Is you should have just told me that you worship your 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 leader. I wouldn't be bothered coming here. Rabi' ibn Amr, radiyallahu ta'ala, another sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was a Bedouin. Okay, he was a Bedouin. He grew up in the desert. He doesn't know anything. But when he became Muslim, when he accepted Islam, subhanallah, he became another Muslim convoy. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas said, Rustum is calling for us, go speak to him. Rustum was the Persian leader, a commander. So Rabi' ibn Amr went to him. When he went, he saw the people are standing. You know, they're all looking down. And Rustum is sitting on the throne. Okay, it's a long story. To cut it, so you went straight to him. I said, what do you want? Why did you call me? So he said, why are you all here? Why did you have to leave Mecca and Medina and come here in Iran? Why? He said, Majina. We didn't come here. Allah Allah has sent us to come to you. He said, why? He said, Spontaneously, by looking at the people, he said, so we could take out the slaves from the slavery of the slave to the slavery of the Lord of the slave, Allah Azza wa And then the next thing is something that no one thinks about this. And it is quoted incorrectly sometimes. وَمِنْ ضِيقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَىٰ سَعَتِهَا نَوْ سَعَةِ الْآخِرَةِ وَمِنْ ضِيقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَىٰ سَعَتِهَا And to take you out from the narrowness of this world to its vastness. He said, you, to, to you people, your world is too small. You know, you've got a job, 9 till 5. What do we do? We're going to stand in front of Rustam. That's our world. What are you going to do tomorrow? The same thing. One day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every single day, end of the month, we're going to get our salary. This is my small world. He says, say, La ilaha illallah. Say, Muhammad Rasulullah. Allah will open your bosom, open your mind. You will become leaders. And that's what the Prophet of Allah was saying, sallallahu alayhi wa He said, oh, yo people. Qulu la ilaha illallah. Tuflihu. Say, la ilaha illallah. Allah will give you success. What sort of success you will get? He said that, Tadinu lakum al Arab. You will become, you will, you will have dominion over the Arab. And, wa... And the non-Arab, they will become subordinate to you. And if that is not enough, If you were to die, Allah will make you kings in Jannah. Prophet of Allah spoke like this. But he went to one tent, to another tent, to another tent, and the Prophet of Allah was preaching. Subhanallah, the day he became Prophet, he came back to his wife, Khadija al-Kubra radiallahu anha, and, and he said to her, Ya Khadija, la rahata li ba'da al my people having all sorts of problems. They're domestic problems, social problems, economical problems, ideological problems. They worship idols. And they say there's nothing better than worshipping idols. I have to tackle all these problems, not only my, my, my community. I have to, I am the prophet of the entire mankind. لا راحة لبعد اليوم. I don't think I could rest again. And in one moment the prophet said, لقد خشيت على نفسي. I fear for myself. What sort of fear? Hafiz ibn Hajar Asqalani, he said, the fear is not the fear that he's going to die. The fear is that I have such a huge responsibility. I have to preach them. I have to take them out of, from gulumat, from darkness, ila nur, to light. Have you noticed in the Quran, whenever Allah mentioned the prophets, he says, liyukhrijahum, 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 to take them out, to take them out. It doesn't mean to take, change locality, it's the mindset. To take them out from what? Min al-dhulumat. The word dhulumat is plural. From darknesses. And the word nur is singular. Because the people were in so many darknesses. Ideological darknesses, the sins and the shirk and the kufr and etc. And ila nur. Because the haq is one. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet to take them out of darknesses to nur. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he began to teach, he began to preach. Subhanallah. And he was witnessing results in front of him. You know, people were understanding that this is what we're supposed to do. This is the teaching of Ibrahim. This is the teaching of, teaching of his son, Ismail, alayhi salatu salam. Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa his teaching is not different from any of them. We have the Kaaba in front of us, yet we are worshipping idols. They realized the truth, and they began to accept Islam. They came with a plan. And always remember, brothers, the disbelievers will always come with a plan. Okay? They will, so they came with a plan that we need to stop this. You know, in Kaaba, there were four main roads. Like we have our, you know, uh, in, I'm from London, so M25 is very important to us. So you have all these main roads. So you know when you go to Kaaba, you head of Rukn al-Yamani, uh, Rukn al-Iraqi, Rukn al-Shami, Hajar al-Aswad. So these were the four roads actually. There's four ways of coming to the Kaaba. 
So they put the chairs and tables in the four corners. Or just say that they open four channels, like we have CNN, and we have, mashallah, BBC, and etc. And we have the Fox News and everything. When it comes to uh, humiliate the Muslims, this channel, they will leap forward. And you know that. So this kind of destruction, uh, this kind of plans will continue till the day of Qiyamah. But Allah has a better plan. So they came with this plan, that all people, when you go to Mecca, then offer your respect for the Kaaba, do your sacrifices. But there's a man there, he's called Muhammad, don't speak to him. He's a madman. He's, he's a madman. So one person, he was called Imam, I think, he said that, he's a madman here, I should, then I should speak to him, because I'm a tabib, I'm a doctor. You know, I've, I've taken up so many jinn, you know, he's a good amil, like you say. So many jinns, I've taken them out, and I'm, you know, I know much. So he went to him. He said, are you Muhammad? He said, yes, I am. He said, sit down. Prophet of Allah sat down. Subhanallah, anyone could speak to the Prophet of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And remember, I was telling you that this was a good thing as well, that the people used to behave like this. It's not a bad thing. Prophet Allah sat down. He said, do you know who I am? The Prophet said, no. He said, I'm a tabib. I'm a very popular doctor. You know, if you are possessed, if you have some jinn inside you, I could take it out. And if you have some sort of magic spell, I could cure you as well. The Prophet of Allah said, you finished? He said, yes. So would you listen from me now? He said, yes. He said, Alhamdulillahi Ahmaduhu. وأستعينه وأستغفره من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا رسول الله. he said ماذا قلت أعد علي ماذا قلت أعد علي what did you just say what did you just say twice then three times he said repeat again the prophet of Allah repeated three times he said لقد بلغت كلماتك قاموس البحر he said I am a poet all the words that you have just narrated to me they are so rich in the meaning that even the ocean, they cannot encompass all that. Hati yadak, give me your hand. The Prophet gave him his hand. He grabbed the hand and he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah. That I bear witness none with worthy of worship but Allah. And I bear witness that you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are the messenger of Allah. He came to cure the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He goes back to cure. This was the approach of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did not give up. Subhanallah, this was his approach. Every time you see someone, the Prophet of Allah will speak. Another sahabi. Radiallahu ta'ala, he came from Yemen. And it takes a month's journey, by the way, to get, come from Yemen to, to, to Mecca. And it's a very difficult journey. Because, you know, uh, in the olden days, if you were to travel, then it's very difficult. Because you don't know if you're going to come back. That's what it's called a qafila. You know, you hear, in Urdu we say qafila. It comes from the Arabic word qafila. Qafila means qafala, yakfilu means to come back, to return. So they used to be so optimistic about the caravan. They named it that I hope they will return back to us. Kafila means they will come back because they never used to return. So he came back, long journey, to pay respect to the Kaaba. When he pay, and so they said to him, they recognized him, the Quraysh straight away. And he said, oh, you're coming from Yemen. He said, yes. He said, you're a leader. He said, yes, I'm a leader. of the tri-. He said, you're a very good poet as well. He said, yes, because poets were respected there. He said, don't, there's a man there, he's called Muhammad, don't speak to him. Because if you speak to him, he will be with you. He said, okay, no problem. Now, he was very loyal to the Quraysh. So he took the advice quite seriously. So he said, what I did, I got some wool, cotton wool, and I put it into my ears. And I said, so that I don't, basically in our term, we put a big headphone, an earphone. That said, I'm not going to listen to him. He came. And he said that, Allahu Akbar, Allah wants to give hidayah. He came and he was paying his respect, and there was a man next to him reciting Quran. He was, I didn't know that the man who was reciting the Quran is the same man they told me not to stand next to him. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He said, by Allah, some of the words, بعض الكلمات, he said, some of the words that he was reciting came into my ear. And it was so beautiful. And he was inviting me to listen to. You know, mashallah, uh, the brother who recited uh, some verses of poetry, he has a beautiful voice. Okay, we have so many qari in the Quran, they recite Quran beautifully. Okay, imagine Rasulullah sallallahu is reciting. Quran was revealed to him. You know, sometimes when you listen to qari Abdul Basid, Abdul Samad, and Manshawi, and etc., you want to listen to them again and again. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Quran was revealed to him. No one can re- uh, recite better than Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa In Salat al-Maghrib, the Imam been told to make the recitation shorter. The Prophet of Allah, he recited the whole Surah Safar. And no one even realized. No one recognized that this is what he did. Such was the beauty of the recitation, they never felt it. After only Salat, they realized he recited Surah Safar. And Surah Safar is not a short Surah. So this was the recitation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he said to himself, you know what? I'm a poet, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an expert in language, yes, that's what I do. So, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a smart person, 
I'm a leader. People listen to me. I'm very influential in my community. Why shouldn't I listen to him? So he took the wool. And Allah wants to give him hidayah. So he took the wool or the cotton now. And he listened. And he said, Wallahi, I listened to his words and it was beautiful <coughs> words. And then I saw that the people were eyeing at me from far away. The oldest people watching him. <laughs> so I saw them looking at me from far away. So I waited for my moment. When it was dark, and then when this person, Muhammad, وسلم, when he was going home, I followed him. I came to his house. Okay? I knocked on the door. And then he opened. And he said, it is me. I was sitting next to you. So the Prophet said, yes. What do you want? He said, I heard some of the recitation that you recited. The Prophet said, okay. Did you like it? He said, I liked it. I loved it. I want to hear some more. He said, okay, come inside. Because that was the time. The Prophet said, okay, come inside. He went inside. And the Prophet of Allah وسلم, said, what do you want? He said, recite to me more. The Prophet of Allah recited more Quran. And he said, oh, Prophet of Allah, now tell me what is Islam. The Prophet of Allah taught him Iman and Salah and etc. Then the person, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah. He becomes Muslim. And then he goes, I'm going back to my tribe. I'm going to entire, entire my tribe. Rasulullah sallallahu said, do that, but take it easy. He said, give me some sign. But the Prophet of Allah sallallahu he gave him some sign. Basically, a light is to come from his face. He said, oh, Prophet of Allah, people might think that this sort of, some sort of, ailment or something like that. He said, okay, I'll, I'll give it into your hand. So his hand became like a torchlight. He goes all the way back to Yemen. The tribe of Daus is near Yemen. And then the entire tribe become Muslim. He comes back to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He goes, the Prophet of Allah has already migrated. Battle of Badr took place. Battle of uh, Uhud took place. And Khandak took place. And then when the Prophet of Allah was in Battle of Khaybar, Subhanallah, when you're in the desert, you don't see anything. Okay, it's dark and it's very difficult. When suddenly the Prophet of Allah looked, he saw a huge crowd was coming towards him. And then suddenly this person stepped forward. He said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, do you recognize me? The Prophet said, I think I know you. He said, It's me, Tufail ibn Amr, a dosi, the same person who listened to you once. And then he went to your house. And remember, I told you I'm going to invite my entire tribe because these are the 70 houses that you see, they all accepted Islam. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He began slowly, his, but he got influential people. The like of Abu Bakr, the like of Umar, the like of Uthman, the like of Ali, the like of Tufail ibn Amr al dawsi the like of Hamza radiyallahu anh. He got the influential one involved, and subhanallah, they became leaders immediately. This is the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He knew exactly what to do. Prophet of Allah did not stop. This was his continuous effort for this ummah, so that he could save the ummah. From going to Jahannam, respected brothers and elders and sisters. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in one occasion he came back home, his own daughter couldn't recognize him. I mean, every one of us, inshallah ta'ala, when we go back to our house, our children, our family members will recognize us. That's why they will open the door and they will offer us food and etc. But can you imagine, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam returned home, his own daughter could not recognize. And then when she did recognize the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, she began to weep firstly. She cried. And the Prophet of Allah said, why are you crying? She said, Araka ya Rasulullah, just by looking at you, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Because he was, you know, in the scorching heat of Arabia. The Prophet of Allah, he's not, he's not coming home. He goes up in the morning and he returns in the night. He's going from 10 to 10, from one tent to another, to the third and etc. When he came back, the color of his face changed. He was so, so much that, as I said to you, his daughter couldn't recognize. Then she began to weep. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, why are you crying? She said, Araka ya Rasulullah, by looking at you, Prophet of Allah. Qad wa Look what has happened to your clothes, it's torn apart. And the color of your face has changed. The Prophet of Allah said, you don't need to weep anymore. Because Allah has accepted my effort. And he gave me the glad tidings that a time will come when, enter, when, when, when Islam will enter into the four corners of the world. It will reach every single house. Whether it is made of bricks or straw or mud. Rasulullah he did not stop. Allah gave him the glad tidings, he did not stop. He goes to Taif, and with this I will end. He goes to Taif. What happened when he went to Taif? Did the Prophet of Allah stop? So why is it that when we have a little bit of problems, when we have a little bit of calamities, we have a little bit of trials and tribulation, we want to stop? Brothers, you know this thing that we are witnessing, what is happening in, 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 in the countries that we are witnessing, in the Muslim countries and etc., that should not make us weak. In fact, on the contrary, it should make us more stronger believer. Because the Prophet of Allah has already prophesied all this. But, he, but one thing that he told us, that at the time of fitna, at the time of corruption, don't forget to hold on to Quran and Sunnah. This is the, these are the two things will save you. 
So inshallah ta'ala, this shouldn't make us, any, this shouldn't demoralize us. It should give, increase us in iman. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went to Taif. And people, not a single person listened to him. No one. When he was coming back, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he was bleeding from everywhere, someone offered him a date, or some dates. Even now as well, if you go to Taif, because I went there, just to examine, I went to the same area where the Prophet of Allah sat down and he had those dates. I went to that area and you know the Ottoman, the Uthmani Yun, they made a, a small little masjid there. No one prayed the Salah. Ottoman, they had their own style. They knew that if you make a masjid, no one will demolish it. They will keep it. So they remember the place. And uh, all the credits go to Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah. Anyway, I went to that area and near that area, it's, this whole area is known for grapes. Beautiful, really big grapes. And people are selling grapes there as well. Nevertheless, so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sat there and they gave him some grapes. And the Prophet of Allah, he took a grape. And he said, Bismillah. He's about to walk away from there now. Because no one accepted him. He said, Bismillah. The person who was sitting there, he was called Addas. He's the one who offered him. He said, Bismillah. Ahlu hadha al-balad la yaquluna ma taqul. He said, did you just say something? Bismillah. He said, yes. He said, the people of this city, when they have food, they don't say Bismillah. So who are you? The Prophet of Allah said, Min ayy baladin and you tell me first, where are you from? He said, I'm from Ninua, which is from Mosul near Iraq. The Prophet of Allah said, Anta min baladi Yunus ibn Matta. You're from an area which is a, a Prophet of Allah called Jonah, the son of Matthew. Yunus ibn Matta, in Arabic we say, Jonah, the son of Matthew, was sent there. He said, I've left this city. No one knew about Yunus ibn Matta except myself and few others. How do you know? He said, Kana rasulan wa ana rasul. He was a messenger. I'm also a messenger. And he said that when the Prophet of Allah said he was a messenger and I'm a messenger too, he fell into the feet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam crying and saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka Rasulullah. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was bleeding from everywhere. But when he left Taif, he left with a smile because one person became Muslim. By the way, the whole area is called now after this person called Addas. Subhanallah, this was the effort of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nothing stopped him. Beating, throwing stones at him, swearing at him, and slapping him on the face, and pushing him away. Nothing, because all he wanted was peace for humanity. Rahmah lil alameen. He was the mercy for everyone. Respected brothers and elders and my sisters, when we study the books of Sirah with the, in this kind of light, when we study the books of Sirah to bring it to our life, as the previous speakers were, were saying, then inshallah ta'ala, our whole life, and ideas will change, inshallah ta'ala. Our, we will have a, a life full of joy. Maybe we will weep, but even that will bring taste as well, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanallah, many brothers, many of our, our family members, they study so many books. In this, when we go to school, we study so many books. How many of us here has finished a book in Sirah? Why is it that we can't study books in Sirah? When you study a book in Sirah, move on to another book, because every writer is different. If you want to study a book of Sirah in English, there are so many books written in Sirah. Okay, and then if you want more, there are different, different books as well. The Shama'il as well about the appearance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you finish that, read Zahdul Ma'ad. It's in five volumes. Each volume is 500 pages. It talks about the, uh, you know, it talks about the ahkam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, the way he prayed. And like the brother very beautifully sang, you know, I want to talk like the Prophet. I want to speak like the Prophet. I want to look like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want to, I want to, I want to pray like the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You'll find it in this book. It's in seven, five, six volumes as I said to you. If you think you have more time, move into another one. al Khasais Al-Kubra. It talks about the specific appearance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The specific qualities that no one else has. If you have more time, there are many other books as well. Subhanallah, all these books are translated into English. We have time to read so many books. We are trying to read so many books that maybe we shouldn't be reading those books anyway. But we don't have the time to read the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So my final message will be to all the brothers and sisters from here that... Every one of you make an intention that inshallah ta'ala we will study the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In depth inshallah ta'ala. From cover to cover. We will study every single aspect. And when we have any questions, then we will come to the ulama. So they will give us more guidance.